Okay, I'm so excited to have you all here today. It is Wednesday. I'm here with the amazing Mark Fest, and we're here to talk about being in the same boat and whatever else uh, comes up, how social distancing brings us closer together. I'm Marta Siebenhar. My company's called Cultured Innovations. We're here to talk about creativity and how to creatively uh, manage times of uncertainty, such as the one that we're in right now. So Mark, tell us a little bit more about you and what you're up to. Yes, uh, thanks for having me on your show, Marta. This is so cool. Hello, everybody. I can't see you, but uh, hello there. I'm a communications coach. I, I help people communicate successfully in moments that are important to them. And these are usually just moments like when you can pitch an idea you have in a meeting or when you have a job interview or Marte, like imagine if you were at a conference of life coaches or coaches and you're on a panel and, 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 and you get two minutes to introduce yourself and you would like everybody that night to come up to you to talk about your message from the heart cards, you know, this beautiful deck that you created. So what do you say, you know, in that two minutes? And so, so these are the kinds of things that I help people um, practice. And, and often it has to do with talking to potential donors or talking to the media, but it's, it's usually always about pers being persuasive and being succinct and, and being clear. I love that. I could definitely use some coaching on the, on the, <laughs> on the card, so. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty <laughs> simple, you know, you, I, I use a framework and it's really just nine steps and it's a, it's a bit like painting by numbers. I, I could probably talk you through your elevator speech. I can do this in my sleep by now because it's all I do. <laughs> Like in, in just two minutes, if you want to, um, you know, it's, it's really easy about your, your beautiful cards. Sure, let's that? do it. All yeah. right, let's, just, let's just wing it, all right? Um, all right, let, all let right. me so, first tell everybody. So I wrote a book in 2019 in about six weeks and it ended up in this form of cards. So yes. I hired the amazing Diana Guerrero and um, she made these beautiful cards with all these beautiful designs. And um, yeah, so these are all about, I'm a, I do loving kindness meditation every day and these came out of that. So how right. was that? <laughs> that was awesome. That was like your, your initial version of your elevator speech about your cards. I love it. And these, I have those cards too. I'm, I'm, I'm a proud <laughs> early adopter of these cards and I, I got an inscription on my um oh, box that's true i forgot Marta, yeah. you know I remember <laughs> so and you know they're all already kind of used and mixed up you know because they, they're really useful all right so we're not going to do a normal training i'm just going to walk you through real quick you Great. know so usually i wouldn't do it like do that it. <laughs> but let's say you know you're on the panel um and the the audience is full of other coaches but also people from companies that hire coaches and that might want to buy, you know, your card for everybody in their company, you know, your deck of cards. So you really have something at stake there. So you want to, you want to sort of get them to all like at the cocktail reception that night, you want them all to walk up to you and say, Hey, tell me more about these cards. This is so okay. cool. And that is going to be your chance then to sort of, you know, talk them up to, to, to buy those cards by the thousands. Right. So okay, here's how you do it. Like it's nine points. It's really like painting by numbers. So the first one is just a, a introduction. Uh, you just say your name and, and what you do in the, in the shortest possible form. So how would you do that? Just do it. I'm Marta. I'm a coach and a consultant and I help people be successful. Okay, great, great. So you, you've tef definitely oriented people um, right away in, in five seconds. A lot of people make the mistake of talking too long, like taking too long in that section. They wanna cram too much information about how they do things. That's a bad thing because you immediately wanna get to what I call the value proposition. Mm -hmm. So you did introduction orientation. Now you get to the value proposition. And since you want to like get people excited about your cards, what you're going to do is you're going to, again, in a very brief sentence, and that is key. You're going to say something like, now, one of the things that I'm most excited about right now is a recent project. I've created a deck of cards of 52 cards and each of these cards, and now comes the value proposition, allows you to receive a message from your heart in a different way and benefit from its awesome power. I just made this up, right? <laughs> but it was pretty good, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so so you, you articulated a value proposition. And again, you, you only took like five, five seconds to do that. So we're 10 seconds into your speech now. Now comes a really important part. A lot of people at this point may make the mistake that they go on talking about, um, you know, what the cards look like, how they've been designed and, 
you know, what kind of, that, that would be a mistake because you want to do that at some point, but first you want to create a picture of why these cards are super urgently needed. You know, it's the big why. And most people skip it because they're so focused on what they do, they get to the what. They talk about the cards. Yeah. You want to talk about the why. And you want to actually tell people that you're, about, that you're about to talk about that. And so you say something, there's a huge problem when it comes to messages from the heart. So everybody's leaning forward now. They say, what's the huge problem? You know, and the problem is most people never hear them. Oh, right. Hmm. You know, it and it's a, it's, it's a tragedy. <laughs> it's a tragedy. Yeah. Why? Because they have such incredible healing power. Mm. They can help us in all kinds of situations. And then you, you know, they can like, if you're sick, you know, if you have stress at work, if you have like a difficult moment um, with COVID-19, you know, you just like listening to these cards can really make all the difference. And it's a, a tragically lost opportunity that so many people miss out on this, on this wealth of power and healing that is so easily accessible. So what you just did is you, you, the big why, you know, the tragically lost opportunity. So, so that is important because now everything that you say after this, now you talk about how they work, but people will yeah. appreciate it so much more because right. you've laid out this backdrop of urgency. Yeah. of all these unheard messages from their hearts, you know? So then you say, so here's what I've done. Here's the solution. So you always, you know, you use these signpost sentences to orient people as to what you're about to say. So you say things like, here's the big problem and here's the solution, you know, it makes comprehension easier for folks, you know? Okay. So now you can talk about how the cards actually work. You can give a few examples, you know? So you say, you know, it's like 52 and, you know, each has a different, uh, message on it, then you have to say, for example, at least twice. For example, number 37. Uh, the way you love is special and very important because it's completely unique. No one else loves like you do. You know? Or number 60, and then you read that. And then you have to say one sentence that begins with one thing that is unique about these cards. Because that really always works very well in this, what I call the solutions section. Mm -hmm. you know? You're taking notes? <laughs> so you say like one thing that is unique about these cards and you just finish that sentence well like, what is a unique thing about these cards you just do it. so so, uh, so one thing that is about. unique about these cards is that they give you a way to get inspiration without having to go through a really complicated process you can access wisdom on point on demand excellent so that's 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 good so then the next section is validation and that's usually something where you can associate yourself either with clients or entities where people, when they hear your association, will say, oh, wow, this is legit, you know? And I don't know, what would, what would that be in your case? If you were to, like, just to make up an example, you know, yeah. Oprah recently called me and ordered like 20 of them. <laughs> I'm just making this up, you know? But that would be an example of associating yourself and validating. Or like, you can talk about how much demand you've had, or you can even talk about how a particular person used them in a difficult situation and, and, and found great solace. You know, something like, what, what's your favorite version of like validating this whole thing? The funny thing is this morning, I was watching a video with Dr. Joe Dispenza, who's uh -huh. um, really talks about mindset. Mm -hmm. And in this particular video, he said that if everyone spent four days tuning into their heart, the health of our entire planet would be transformed. That's great. That's great. Even though he doesn't know about your cards, but he's, he's speaking perfectly to that. So you can exploit that. People know his name. That works. That's your validation segment. So we got that. We only have two more to go. Okay. All right. The next one is the, what I call the I'm personal. Just, I'm getting coaching from Mark. This is yeah, you know, it's, uh, just, you know, I love doing this. It's like fun. You know, it's entertaining in a way, isn't it it's stimulating? Fun. So, um, so the next thing is what I call the personalization segment. And the whole purpose of that segment is to create empathy in your listeners. So how do you create empathy? You, you, must, uh -huh. you, you must know that. How do you create empathy? You, you share you something vulnerable about yourself. No, I'm not surprised that you, that's <laughs> exactly that. You know, and, and, and most people, so, so I want people to finish a sentence that begins with, you know, this is really personal 
to me or close to my heart, no pun intended, however you want to do that, <laughs> you know? And then you finish a sentence, but you do it in a way exactly like you said, by disclosing something vulnerable. Like some people like make the mistakes and, and, and say things like, oh, I, I graduated summa cum laude from Harvard in psychology, and that's why I love creating these cards. No, <laughs> that's not what you, you don't want to say something that is about making yourself seem great. You know, you yeah. want to say something because if you share something vulnerable, if you lower your guard, your listeners will do the same thing and they, they will look at you not anymore as a professional, as a speaker, as a entrepreneur, but as a fellow human being. And anything that you say when they're in that state of mind will reach them twice as deeply. You know, that's why we're doing this. And the key, key thing is to, so, so I know, you know, I've, I've listened to you before, Marta, you know, this will probably be a chance to, to, to say something to the effect of how five years ago you went through a very rough patch. You know, I happen to know that you've told me about that. <laughs> and, you know, and, and then, then you have to sort of paint a sort of visceral picture of this. You know, I, I woke up every, I, I'm just making this up right now. Um, <laughs> I woke up every morning, you know, with this anxiety in my chest. I, I, I would cry every morning. And this, this lasted for eight months and I was paralyzed. I lost my job, just making this up, you know, whatever. You want to say something? And then he said, I finally got help. And essentially what, you know, was a therapist, but what she really did was teach me to listen to my heart. And that was what really pulled me out of this hole. And, 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 and that, that's where this really comes from, from this experience. And then you do what I call the more transition. And that's important. So people don't get the perception that it's all about you. You know, you, you just talked about, so, so you wanna pivot away from yourself. So the way you do that, it's really simple. You say something like, all right, so, so this is personal to me, but what's way more important, and that's why I call it the more transition, what's way more important is what these cards, what these messages from our hearts can do for all of us for us as a community, for us as a nation, for us as a universe. I just made this up, I'm going a little bit over the top, but basically what you do is you pivot away from yourself and by saying, you know, um, it's, it's important to me, but there's something that is much more important and you kind of reinvoke the urgency thing, mm. you know, the healing power, you know? And, and, and what you do in that moment is you self-deprecate a little bit, which is great, you know, because you, you wanna pivot again to, to why this matters in the larger scheme. Of things and so then comes the final ninth element in your okay. elevator speech and that's your call to action and you you preface it with a signpost phrase again you say all right so here's what you can do okay and remember this is a conference with a cocktail hour that night okay um you can say you can say so if you see me standing around with a glass of wine at the cocktail reception tonight <laughs> please come up and say hello if you want to know more about the cards you can also go to messages from the heart.org or whatever it is, you know? So that's your call to action. You actually tell people what to do. The mistake that a lot of people make is that they, first of all, they don't know exactly how they're gonna end. So they start like stammering and, and stuttering. So that's not a good thing. And then they make it conditional. If you are interested, if you want to know more, you know, you might, you know, it'd be great if, you know, no, you command them. Thanks. Come up and say hello, go to this URL. And then you stop there and that's it. So just nine points. It's, it's like painting by numbers, you know? Okay. Yeah. All right. This, All is, right. this is really fun. And, you know, I did write these, not for me. I wrote them to, to help people. So yes. it's very personal because you're right. It came from a very, a very dark period in my life. Yes. I feel like only my heart could really save me. And I have yeah. no problem telling anybody I was in a dark place, yes. but that's where, that's where my heart has always come yeah. to. And actually today I'm, I'm wearing a bit of Venetian glass that is a oh, in the shape of a heart that my sister gave me. Um, I love Christmas, it. So. I love it. Um, I'm so excited to be here with you. How fun is this? Um, if anyone on, um, on Instagram or on Zoom or on Facebook has questions for Mark and Elevator Speech Training, the, the program that he does, um, let me know. Just let us know in the comments. I think we're maybe having a little bit of streaming problems. Internet, everybody's using the internet now. <laughs> um, but otherwise, Mark, I want to hear more about, um, you know, we talk a lot. We've been friends for, I don't know, maybe a year or so. Mm -hmm. um, 
and you've been doing some really interesting things. You're a very creative person and you know, you've had some pivots in your own business as you've kind of figured out your rhythm and you've figured out kind of what, what people are interested in. Can you talk to us a little bit about how kind of like your, your journey as an entrepreneur has been a little bit nonlinear, but totally finding your niche. I, I love where you, what you're doing now. And I think it's just like such a cool thing that there's yes. so much demand for it. Yes. I, I must say, first of all, what I'm doing now, I've never enjoyed anything more. It took me 53 years. You know, you always talk about how you have to find what really makes you happy and do that. It took me 53 years to figure this out. And I've never felt happier and more fulfilled and more useful, really, um, than, than now. Yeah. But I've, I've done a lot of different things before. And I want to make it short because, you know, um, I, I started out in Berlin right after the war fell as a freelance um, journalist writer. Um, then I came to the United States and I was a hobby programmer and I accidentally wrote something called Quick Browse software that people could use online to basically view multiple websites at once by stitching them together into one long page. So that was in 2000 or so. And, uh, I, you know, a hundred newspapers wrote about it and I got investor money. I didn't mean it to be a, 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 a business. I wrote it for myself, but it became a business. So I was like a web entrepreneur for, um, for five years or so. One of the companies that licensed the technology was the Miami Herald. That's how I met Alberto Ibaguen, who is the CEO of the Knight Foundation. So he was instrumental. He was a great mentor to me. Uh, he, he, at some point, uh, had the wisdom of seeing that my quick browse internet thing was not going to go anywhere. Um, like so many dot-com companies. So uh, he, he helped me um, work for the New World Symphony, uh, the same organization that you work for, America's Orchestral Academy. Nice. And um, it was really my first ever real job. Remember, I was only a freelance writer and a wannabe internet entrepreneur. So I, for, for some reason, probably because Alberto has a lot of sway in this community, they made me um, vice president of communications <laughs> right away, <laughs> which, which you know, was, was, was great. And then a few years later, um, I, I switched to Knight Foundation and did the same thing uh, there. And as you know, we, we know one another because um, my, my successor there is uh, our friend, your partner, my friend, Andrew Sherry. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I, I left Knight Foundation. I, I am not good at working in an office environment. I wanted to go back to my uh, the freedom of my early years, um, you know, as a, a freelance writer or doing my own thing with the internet. So I, I, I began working as a commun communications consultant. I did everything for the last, like until last year. Uh, uh, if you needed a website, I created a website. If you needed a brochure, I did that. If you wanted a speech or a business uh, communications plan, I did all these things. And I think I was reasonably good at all of those so that I could actually make a living with that. But to tell you the truth, I didn't really feel that I was like exceptionally gifted at any one of these. I was just like good enough, you know, <laughs> which was probably pretty good, but actually definitely not gifted. All right. And, um, and then I had an idea that totally failed. And you know about this one too, which was called Grand Impact. And so I thought that I could create an online communications course for nonprofits that um, where I wouldn't have to do the work anymore. Instead, they would take this course and foundations would pay for it. Totally failed. And I, I got, you were so kind to sign up as a coach on that platform. You never got any work to do because it failed. Um, so I, I realized at some point that, you know, this really was not going to work. People were not interested in this. But one thing, one sliver of it that they liked was this elevator speech training, which was like one component that had, that resonated. And so I just, you know, pivoted once more and, and, and started focusing on that. And it was just, there were, immediately was traction and it really, there was demand, people got it. I didn't have to explain it. You know, the benefit of it was self-evident. Like all the uh, difficulties that I encountered with Grand Impact uh, suddenly were gone. It really worked. It's an, it was a nice feeling to suddenly see demand. And, and I work a lot with foundations who pay for the training so that their grantees, the nonprofits that receive grants from them uh, can improve their ability to be persuasive, get support, get donations, um, et cetera. And it's, it's, been, it's been wonderful. You know, I do like what we're doing right now, the Zoom call, this is how I make my living. Every day I have two or three of these calls. I, um, I meditate before each call for 10 minutes to, to, to free up my mind. Mm. You know, I used to meditate in the morning and now I do it like three times for 10 minutes. So that's 
you know, that's enough. <laughs> and, and you meet such wonderful people because these are like people that receive monies from foundations. They're all people that try to make the world a better place. Sure. And, and uh, there are all kinds of, like, to give you an example, like yesterday, I was coaching a transgender African-American um, woman uh, who is a sex work activist. So she wants to decriminalize voluntary sex work, which is a controversial thing. So how interesting is that? And what she wanted to uh, do is like uh, practice a phone call that she was going to have with a councilman about releasing nonviolent offenders from local prisons because of COVID-19. Wow. So I was I was pretending to be um, the, the the council man, and 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 she was talking. So we do the whole thing. We listen to it afterwards on the same call. You know, the next call might be like an hour later. You know, with a um, you know person from the Nuclear Threat Initiative. Like this is a think tank where people think about things like the impact of artificial intelligence on nuclear command and control systems and how that might impact the president's ability to react when he gets information about in incoming missiles. Really crazy stuff, you know? So in that case, you know, I was pretending to be Nancy Pelosi, you know, and, 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 and that, that expert was trying to get Nancy Pelosi to, to take this more seriously. Or I, I often pretend to be Judy Woodruff because people want to get ready for appearances on the, on the news hour. So I, I have a lot of Judy Woodruff in me and I love it. That's amazing. Um, but anyway, so yeah, you can see I get I get excited about this. It's uh, I, I love so doing great. it. great. So just let me pull out a couple things from what I'm hearing, which is like, first of all, know yourself. Know what environments in which you thrive and, and the environment you need in order to do your best work. Be able to know yourself well enough to be honest with yourself um, and not afraid to make changes. So one thing that I'm always encouraging people to do is to do a little experiment. Um, before making a leap or saying, this is what I'm doing for the rest of my life, just do a small experiment, give yourself a timeline, gather data because anything you get from life experience will be helpful. Even if you can't see it right now, eventually all of it will mesh together to be the beautiful mosaic that is you. And then notice what's successful and double down on it. Um, also being able to have a quiet moment to do your best work. We are so full and we have constant messages coming at us all the time. So being able to carve out space to just be mm -hmm. um, in order to, to do your best work. And then the, the last thing that I'm hearing is like, everyone has trouble communicating clearly. It doesn't really matter who you are. We could all use a little bit of coaching to help us get our message across because we make assumptions that people know what we do. Or that's, then we learn the grant language and we're like using all the big words that are not, don't belong in human speech, like hum, human to human kind of thing. And that, that's true for the coaches as well, by the way. You know, just because I do this kind of coaching doesn't mean that I wouldn't, wouldn't benefit from being coached myself. Actually, I need to be coached myself. And I need to get that feedback because yeah. it's really uh, something that is a human, part of the human condition that we have these blind spots. You yes. know, and it is through getting this, this honest, empathetic feedback that um, we, we, we can improve how we communicate. Absolutely, absolutely. I always say every coach needs a coach. So thank yep. you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for being a coach for me today. Oh my goodness. Thank you for being a coach to me Good. today. A <laughs> <laughs> um, couple more things. So we're talking, when you and I talk, we often end up on the subject of unity and less what we have that is different, which everyone is telling us how we're different. I think right now, we're all in the same boat, so mm -hmm. to speak. So tell us more about kind of your, your thoughts about COVID. Oh, okay, background switch. <laughs> uh, yeah, tell us about your project and then also just what you're noticing in these times of uncertainty, what mm -hmm. you're noticing people do in terms of being in that same boat. Yes, yes. So, you know, this is not like a project that's almost too big of a word for it. It's just okay. a web address I bought 10 years ago. It's at in the same boat.org. And all you can do there really is you can download these, these images um, that show the world in the same boat and you can use them to put them uh, in your email signature. For instance, that's something I've done, or um, you can post them on Facebook or Instagram. It's just like a small way of, of spreading the notion that, you know, we're all in the same boat. And the premise behind this is that if more people felt like this, 
um, they, they, the world would be a better place. And I created this not now for COVID-19, actually. I, I began doing this more than a year ago. Um, it just only now seems to have taken on a, a new layer of relevance where everybody who sees this says, oh, wow, yeah, we're all in the same boat, you know. And one, one thing I must say is for me, I have all these T-shirts. I, I think I gave you some, you know, with this. I forgot <laughs> to know? wear it today. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for, for me, it has a comforting notion, this idea. And I feel it, especially now in, in COVID-19, there's something comforting and encouraging about this notion of we're all in the same boat. And, and the, the, the image, you know, does imply um, a, a difficult situation. You know, that boat is that rescue boat that is left after the big ship has sunk, you know, and you're in that same boat. So it, 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 it implies that difficult situation. For some reason, I find it a, a comforting notion, maybe because it does bring us together. And, and to answer your question, uh, you know, almost every training that I do, it, it begins by not talking about folks' elevator speech and, and whatever project they have, but really about their situation. Hey, you're at home right now. How are things going? You know, and, you know, and, and they talk about their children or the worries and, and we just share, you know, and, and uh, I, I do, you know, as you said, everybody's using the internet these days, Every, like Zoom stock is up, I don't know, 100%, you know, um, and uh, I, I was, you know, a few weeks ago, I actually was March 11th. I had a uh, appointment, a routine appointment with my endocrinologist. And I was already very sort of sensitive about this whole situation. So I called up and I said, hey, can we do this by Zoom? And, and, and they got back to me and said, yeah, we can, we can do this um, by, they had their own system. And, and so we finally saw one another, uh, he did it at night from home. And I said to him, hey, you must be doing this um, a lot. And he says, no, you're actually the first one. And I, this is the first time I'm ever using this feature in this patient portal system. And, and now I'm getting these emails from him that he keeps doing it. But one thing that he said was, he said, you know, I always had a reservation about doing these things by video because I feel, and I'm, I'm quoting him right now, I feel that you can't really have that human connection mm. when you use that. And that's where I really said, uh, listen, doctor, um, that's just so not true. You know, you, have, you can have a very intimate, a very rich um, um, interpersonal um, connection that almost rivals being physically in the same room. Actually, being physically in the same space is overrated. What matters far more is what we are experiencing right now. Mm -hmm. And it works beautifully. And I think that is something that a lot of people are um, discovering. They're discovering that they can be very social thanks to technology. And that's why I think that, and this is not my idea, a trainee yesterday said that to me, public health person. Uh, she said, you know, social distancing, is, it's, it's an unfortunate phrase mm. because um, it, it makes people think that they have to distance themselves socially. You should call it like physical distancing or spatial distancing, mm. but not social distancing, just to avoid sending the message you don't you should not be social. She said, you know, like people not only uh, keep distance from one another as they pass one another on the streets, they don't even look at one another. As if, you know, the social thing is the bad thing. You know, so it's actually, she said, not a good phrase, you yeah. know, because we, we can be very social and there can be a lot of unity uh, in this uh, physical distancing that we have to practice right now. For sure, I've, I've noticed that as well. Um, and I've had a friend also, uh, I think Corey Davis was t telling me about how in his mind, it is just physical distance. It's not necessarily social distance because yes. we're still interacting, right? Yes. Um, and it's funny because I, I was walking in the neighborhood on Sunday and I was leaving, you know, I saw a couple coming. So I moved into the street to give them space. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, oh, hey. And it was friends that I haven't seen in, I don't know, like a couple months. And I didn't realize they were living in the, the building right next door, mm -hmm. but they weren't even going to look at me either. So it was kind of like a, a moment where we're like, oh, actually we can have this nice conversation and really catch up and, you know, hear about the jobs and, and everything that, that's happening. So yeah, for sure, physical distancing versus social distancing, unity. I'm noticing people giving up their personal comfort for the greater good. So mm -hmm. like all of these things give me a lot of hope. So Mark, um, just to wrap up, why don't you give us a call to action um, or a tip or something to just kind of close it out? Well, um, maybe 
you know, uh, pivoting off what we just talked about, maybe the call to action to all of us is to, to find ways to, to, to connect and, and have a social moment while we keep our physical distance. And maybe that means to, you know, smile at a stranger, you know, and maybe look at a stranger that we otherwise would not have looked at. Something as simple as that. I love it. Well, this has been such a fun conversation and I know we're physically distanced right now, but I totally feel your energy and this has just been a real treat. So I wanna thank you for coming on and uh, this will be available on YouTube if you care to, to watch it later. And otherwise, let us know if you have any questions, any feedback, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you, Mark. I hope you have a great day and, and all best to everybody. <laughs> you have a great day to everybody and, and you, Martin. Thank you.